We were aware there's a lot of research and development on Mars. There are, co there are underground colonies on Mars where they're doing a lot of research and development. The Ceres Colony had research and development places there, but they were more focused on things to trade. So they were working on pharmaceuticals and they were coming up with marketing things to trade with other species. And I was also told that not so much on the Earth as far as R&D goes. The high command was in Antarctica and R&D helped happened elsewhere. How did this 200, 250,000 people get there? Uh, what I was told was that originally that it was an abandoned base, that there was a very small populace, that another species built the caverns and the base early on, like a million years ago kind of thing, but that the base was abandoned. And when the Deutsch made their treaty with the Orion group, they were given Ceres and said, you could go there and build in. And they immediately went in there and began to convert it and make it living quarters for humans. So they converted a lot of the caverns and, and the first thing they did was build European style cities. Have you ever been to a jump gate or a stargate? We were on a base inside the moon that had access to a great power output. We went to a building in Chicago and then back. What I was told was that it took a great deal of power, that even Ceres Colony did not have a system like that. The other thing that was speculation that was in conversation was that it was made out of exotic materials that are found as you get closer to the center of the galaxy, and that extraterrestrials control those elements and actually use them for trade for their own benefit. There isn't really a universal currency, it's technology that they can trade knowledge. So there were times that we traded goods and we traded things for just mathematical equations. Hello everybody, today we take uh, one additional step in this, uh, I would say mind-blowing, crazy for some, unbelievable for others, trip uh, uh, into discovering the life and the adventures, but also the human experience of some of us that uh, seems to have spent time in space, uh, living with human civilizations outside of this planet and coming in contact with uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. We meet today, we have Tony Rodriguez that has a very, very captivating story. Hello, Tony, how are you? Hi, I'm good. So Tony, I wanna do this, rather than starting to introduce, et cetera, et cetera, I want to give our audience immediately kind of a rundown on your life. The first thing is, uh, who are you and what do you do today on planet Earth? I'm Tony Rodriguez. I'm a wood floor refinisher. I live in Michigan, uh, north towards the northern side of half of Michigan. I'm a father of three daughters, married. Recently, uh, in 2015, I got memories back of the time of what happened to me, the abduction experience from when I was a child. And I've chronicled it um, in great detail in my book uh, that was published in January of this year. Okay, where were you born? In Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1972. So have you ever lived on a planet or a moon on a planet different than Earth? Yes. How far is this place from planet Earth? Ceres, I, so I lived on Ceres for probably 12 years and it's in between Mars and the asteroid belt. So it's uh, 1.2 AU-ish. And the name of the place is Ceres? Ceres, yes, C-E-R-E-S. Uh, -E it's a dwarf planet uh, from the asteroid belt, one of the two largest asteroids. During your stay in this place, have you ever come back to planet Earth? We did, we came back to Earth often. We came and picked up cargo and dropped off, delivered cargo to subterranean places and Diego Garcia uh, in the middle of the night, we would come and pick up military surplus cargo once or twice a month. How long did it take to travel from Ceres to Earth? Not long at all. Um, the ship had m several modes of transportation. It could fly A to B very quickly and uh, it could fly instantaneously. It could make its own wormhole and come here instantaneously. So we would fly into space locally, uh, like a hot, like a very high Earth orbit, and then jump straight to Ceres. So it was quick, within 30 minutes. How did you travel? By ship? What, what was the, the mean of transportation? It was a ship. It was about 1,000 feet long, end to end, and about uh, 600 feet wide, and probably five or 600 feet tall. Is it bigger or the same size of a, a US aircraft carrier? I think smaller, uh, that our ship was smaller so we could get into other, uh, so we could maneuver into places secretly in other worlds. We did covert trade missions and it was a stealth type craft. Uh, it had anti-radar and um, it had a lot of stealthy features so that we could do secret trade missions. 
What was the farthest place from Earth you have ever been? The ship used in conjunction with its own wormhole system, uh, natural wormholes, uh, which there are several near the uh, Jupiter in the in the vicinity of Jupiter, and it could go to other galaxies. One of the wormholes could open up access to like 18 other galaxies, and we actually went quite far in distance from the Earth. There was a time when, for a, a short time, for a few weeks, we were logged as the ship that made the farthest distance from our solar system for mankind. Ever used a portable clocking device? No. Okay. Have you seen everybody using a portable clock? I, I have witnessed it on, on ETs, uh, a version of one, yes. Have you ever used an anti-gravity portable device? Yes. Have you ever been through a jump gate or a stargate? A small uh, human-sized portal, yes. Where did you go from to? We were on a base inside the moon. So we're deep under the moon, and there was a, uh, a facility there that had access to a great uh, power output uh, system that's in the moon. And we, we went to Chicago. We went to a building in Chicago and then back. Have you ever talked to an extraterrestrial biological entity? Yes. How did you communicate? Mostly telepathically. Can you communicate telepathically, or is the being that is capable to read your brain? I believe during my time in service that I had an implant that allowed it. We had a translating device implanted, uh, much like what we're seeing now being developed in Neuralink. Why is your story and those of others like you kept secret in your opinion? Well, because if people are aware, they're going to, you know, we've been greatly, we've been plundered and greatly kept in uh, the dark. Our, our developmental stage of mankind has been stunted greatly. Uh, specifically in medical science and in just the knowledge of what's really out there in the universe. We've been purposely kept in the dark and there have been crimes against humanity. So for, uh, for them to admit one thing is going to, you know, once the genie's out of the bottle, it's going to expose a lot of crimes against humanity as well. Your biggest learning from this experience in one world or in a few words, what would it be? Man, just that, uh, you know, no matter what, your, your, your own happiness is something that you've got, you've got to do. It's a state of mind. Your state of mind is the only thing that you really, it's the only currency you really have. And uh, it's really all you are. Um, after all I went through, I learned that it didn't, it didn't matter. My circumstance doesn't dictate my happiness. I dictate my happiness. We will discuss the advanced top secret technological developments at the first Silicon Valley Conference on Secret Space Technologies Business Applications. Experiences and witnesses of advanced technology will present how they have interacted with innovations and discoveries far beyond our current reality, but that may one day become our reality. In this conference, we will discuss the futuristic civilian applications of these technologies to our economy. It is about time that we start challenging our current beliefs and limitations and start to envision a more advanced civilization for us and our children. One day, we may be using some of these secret space technologies to build viable civilian business applications. In 60 seconds, tell us how you went from being a kid in Michigan to being the moon preparing for this special mission to Chicago. In my school, I came in contact with people that had access. And as a form of punishment, they drafted me into the black programs. Uh, I was originally uh, taken to an off-world base and then put into the 20 and back tech uh, with cloning or some other tech. And then I was in Project Grill Flame and went, moved to Peru and lived there for two years and uh, doing intuitive work. And then uh, sold off to the military, where I went into the Mars Colony Corporation, trained on the moon to be a support soldier for ongoing combat missions on Mars. Went there, and that program washed out. Then I was retrained, aptitude test, and retrained for ship maintenance, and sold to the Ceres Colony Corporation on Ceres, where I worked on an old antiquated uh, re retrofitted submarine, where like a World War II submarine was a spaceship. And I did maintenance on that for about eight years. And during that time, I volunteered for high-risk missions in, in hopes of being promoted and ended up on a mission that would began on the moon and went to resurface an extraterrestrials anti-grav unit in a uh, high rise in Chicago. Tell us the context of this mission. How did you enroll? How did you get to the moon? It was a typical day. I woke up on Ceres Colony in a barracks with a lot of other men. We went through our typical morning, the showers, mass showers routine and got dressed. I had a separate uniform that day, I believe. I went on the ship and there was nothing for me that day. The other two guys got work and the ship left and 
I'd like to say 45 minutes after after the ship, um, you know, closed up, we closed doors on the ship. About 45 minutes later, two officers came and got me, and they walked me out to an umbilical. We were we were underneath. We had already docked and went underneath several like uh, I guess there are several layers that are that are lettered and they get more like a higher security clearance the lower you go the two guys that got me were both maybe 19 or 20 years old Deutsch officers for series colony corp and we they walked me and escorted me into you know it felt like a labyrinth of hallways really just a normal looking hall nothing special nothing star trekky and uh I walked through a labyrinth of hallways there were great there were short grays there were tall grays they were just living their working their normal day this was a facility um just like you would walk into a high-rise building and there were people walking back and forth you know past us and some of them happened to be but who work. does that facility belong to i believe that it was referred to as the in uh, the icc the inner interplanetary corporate conglomerate that it was a facility but the the different levels were were belonged to different uh layers of that group and you're saying in these rooms there were humans yes that's right are they mostly americans or other national they seemed like americans yeah but they did not have american uniforms on they had like a separate uniform do you know at this point what is your mission no they gave us a briefing when we got there the three of us walked in so there were two officers younger cadets i, I always call i always call everybody that had a uniform an officer but there were two cadet guys that escorted me from the ship to that room and when i got there there were like four other guys that were like me that were expendable okay and so at this point you get the training can you explain us what was the mission the mission was to so they called it quicksilver but it was mercury they called it quicksilver and we had canisters that were uh, like stainless steel canisters the size of like a 1 liter or 2 liter pop and we had a backpack and Uh, they gave us a harness there were harnesses that went across that crisscrossed and with a backpack with batteries in it and in the backpack had gloves it had like a suction cup system that was the package we each got we each got that system and they said that we were testing the antigrav the unit that it made us weigh like 60% less as a total when we turned it on and we were to climb up a mission they had they showed us a computer graphic on a screen that we would go into a stairwell on a building and we'd climb over the edge and climb up to the roof of the building The reason for that was to test the harness and then at the top we were to repair an anti-grav unit that there was an extraterrestrial living in the top floor of that building and that it lived in lower lesser gravity it preferred lesser gravity than our than the earth and it had a unit on top of the building that lowered its gravity in its room where it was and it had malfunctioned and leaked out all the mercury and so we th- there was a team there already that left us water in the stairwell and left our our backpacks were all waiting for us and the team had already fixed the leak on the unit that we were going there to just refill it with mercury that that was our mission so the room we were in it had a large where the guy stood at their desk they had like a like a cir- circular desk around them they hit a button and an entire wall became transparent there were two black like slate looking stone pads there was a large black pad that you stood on and one right above it so and they were they were huge um they were they were made out of like a black slate like a rock and we walked up there and they said uh they showed us in the graphic that when we when we stood out when we were done we were to stand at attention and that when we were cleared to come they would let us know we'd be cleared to leave we'd face the moon on the uh roof they said that we were to walk into the portal so in that room with the black slates we were lined up behind a line and there was a nut there was an officer there and he told us when to go and he said when he when he told us to go we would walk and he said not to vary your speed you had to go the same speed into the portal and uh when i lined up i was think i was third third in line or so i forget and then it came on you could see a green ball of light there was a hum there was it seemed like a lot of electricity like a static electricity and there was a green ball of light the size of a beach ball and when you got when the the guys that walked into it just disappeared and when it was my turn to walk into it i walked and when i got close to it within probably 3 feet of it i could see the stairwell the room where where i was about to appear like i could see the the door handle and the staircase as i got close to the ball it went from a green ball of light to something that was almost chrome looking and i could see the reflection of the room and then i was in the room i was standing in the place where i could see and it was a stairwell um on top of you know like a staircase 
and there was uh, the door to the left with the with the doorknob and the stairs, and there was a case of water or bottles of water there. They told us to immediately drink the water because it screwed up your electrolytes. So we drank water and walked out, and it was a parapet um, wall, and I could look over the side. We were quite high up, um, where to the point where I couldn't make out people on the on the street. So we were very high up, and cars were tiny. And it was a hot this summer moment, night. You're looking from the window or you're getting outside the over window? a parapet wall. I was on the roof. So the door opened up to one of the late one of the levels, like a roof, and then the building continued up higher to a, to a higher roof. Yeah, this and sounds our, like uh, you know what this sounds like? like the Sears Tower in Chicago. The other thing is that they said that it was closed for business, that we wouldn't be that the route we were going, that there was going to be nobody there to witness us. Um, I don't know what time it was on earth. But um, when we were there, it was it was dark out. It was a hazy summer night. Like, a, you know what I mean? It was a muggy. It was hot and muggy. So let's go on with the mission. What up and now? So our backpacks were waiting for us and we the harnesses and we put our harnesses up and fired up the backpacks. And there was an on off switch and we messed around climbing right there. And then st we all started our climb up. And we started thinking like, what if as long as I hope the batteries don't go dead? You know, because it was a battery unit and we were we were talking amongst ourselves like, you know, if the batteries die on this. It stuck really good. The system worked and climbed really good, but it was still slippery that like uh, you were not 100 percent stuck to the wall like you could be pulled off. The actual weight of the backpack and the harness was pretty heavy. It was 30, 40 pounds of just the harnesses. So on top of your own weight, if the if the anagrav failed or the battery died on it, you know, if it lost power, like it would be enough to pull us off and, or it felt like it. You know, there was great fear. We got over the top and I was under the impression that we were going to do something important. And really, it was like literally just carrying a two liter of mercury. It was a giant air conditioner unit. Like you see these big air conditioner units on top of these buildings. It was a unit like that, but it was really an anagrav unit. And it was disguised as an air conditioner, probably did air conditioning too. But there was a little stainless steel, like a braided hose out. And we, one of us did it. I didn't even do it. I just handed my bottle to him and he would hook up and it would take the mercury into the system. And we all, we each had a bottle. So there were five, five or six bottles. I think one of us took two of them. He just did that. And then we were done. We lined up and like we were supposed to, and we stood at attention and then we were immediately paralyzed and we were taken over. So the encounter with this being, it had the ability to control your body functions as well. So at the moment that it took control and made us stand at attention still, I had the urge of vomiting, uh, crapping myself, peeing and puking all at the same time. Like my entire physiology of my body was, was taken over, it was frozen and shocked. It was a very intrusive experience. And I began to hear a voice of a being that we could see you could see the eyes of it, but the rest of it was invisible. It said things like, you should be proud of yourself for being here, but in reality, you're here to die, or which one of you is it going to be? And it was like threatening us you know, indirectly. And then it, it walked by us. It was quite large, and it walked by us. And when it got close, it, it said that it wasn't allowed to meet us face to face. He had to wear his suit and it was a it was an invisibility techno technology. And he said, but I could show you my eyes. And it was a very large eye. I mean, it was two to three inches and it was yellow, it looked like a reptile's eye. It was a slitted yellow eye. And it came down close to us. And when he came close, I could actually see that the suit was giving off a gas, that it was like a lot of holes pinholes inside what it was wearing even on its face and it was spraying gas out and then somehow projecting what was behind it into the gas so that was the invisibility how it was working it was it was spraying a gas out of the suits and then somehow projecting what was behind it so that's why it was it was an invisibility it had a blurry effect just like in the movies i mean to put it bluntly but also is kind of letting you believe that some of you might be killed by him it was absolutely clear about that that one of us that was there to die that it wanted to kill one of us it wasn't until years later that somebody pointed out to me in an interview you know like it that's probably the whole reason we climbed up the the side of the building was to have adrenaline in our bloodstream so that it could when it ate us we would have adrenaline and from the fear that it actually wanted wanted us to be afraid at the time 
So, which is described in the book, which is a long story. But at the time, I was almost suicidal with my day to day duties. Like I was in the same kind of hopeless existence. So, my state of mind, I wasn't afraid of dying. And so it looked, it came down and looked at me and it said, not you, and moved on. And it inspected us each. You know, we were standing frozen and at attention, shoulder to shoulder. And it expect it inspected us all. And it said, when it got to the end, he started yelling at the last man. And he said, nope, not you either. I don't think it was ever the goal of this guy to kill anybody. I think it was a system of control put in place. I always describe it as best I can from what I remember. So the whole mission was classified. I was not allowed to tell anybody about it after the fact. Like when I went back to Ceres Colony, I was, I was ordered not to speak about what happened. It was top secret. And they said, if I got caught talking about it, I would get in trouble. The last thing it did was it said uh, to one of, it said to one of the men, like it was reading his thoughts or, you know, there was an interaction that I couldn't hear. And he said, you don't have, you have a problem with how it smells. He's like, I don't like the way you smell either. And then all of us simultaneously peed ourselves. Like it made us pee our pants. It got up and walked away where it came back on top of the unit and then back down the other side of it and went away. And we were given the green art. We had, we had a wristband that would blink and it started blinking when it was time to go. And we lined up facing the moon and a portal appeared and we walked into it. And that's, that was the return. Do you have any hypothesis or any idea what the hell is this thing doing there on top of the skyscrapers in Chicago? Uh, well, you know what, I think it's something I thought about a lot since I got my memories back. And the takeaway is that they could be there if, really in any hype, in, in any skyscraper or any building, corporate building in America, you don't know what's inside. And so there are giant areas where the people that work in buildings their whole life, they work 30 years in a career and they don't see every part of the whole building. They don't see what's off limits at the top of it. And so these beings could, we could have, we could have lots of areas on earth with lots of beings from other worlds that are conducting business daily that are living on, amongst us. And we would never know. And there's, there's just no way to know. Interesting. So I want to take a step back now and analyze this mission from a technology standpoint. Do you right. have an idea how this stuff work? This is jump gates. What I was told was that it took a great deal of power that even series colony did not have a system like that to make a, a small wormhole that size for, for an individual. And the reason that it was on the moon was because there's an artificial power source there that was created by an other species long ago. And that there, it was a great deal of power output that series colony did not have the means to generate that kind of power output. So they had free energy, but it was like a small amount of output. So you can't do wormholes, for instance, or jump tech. The ship power systems for the individual ships that we were on that made their own jumping, the power systems were basically leased from another species. So it was something that they did not have the ability to build themselves. So they had to acquire through trade or a lease or some kind of deal arrangement that they made with other species that would build the power system for their larger ships, especially the one that I ended up on, the Max von Laue, for it to be able to jump. And, and go to other places in the galaxy. The other thing that was speculation that was in conversation was that it was made out of exotic materials that are found in, that there are other elements that are found as you get closer to the center of the galaxy and that extraterrestrials control those elements and actually use them for trade for that, for, for their own benefit. Do you know who built this jump gate? There was a rumor that a lot of the things on the moon, a lot of the assets inside the moon have changed hands over time, many times. Like the original builders were a long time ago and that they keeps changing hands uh, through, through organizations. Something else that, that you said is this is a, a command and control uh, room where they operating this jump gate. And you say that they were controlling this with the software. Do you have any visibility of this software? So if you can imagine a desktop that's curved like around you, like a large, like a pretty large area, um, you know, maybe maybe 15 feet of a semicircle of a desktop that is not flat, but curved in a, like an ellipse that went around. It was a touch screen that was that big, that was had several different screens on it that they could, that they could interact with. And during this mission, you used this uh, gravity reduction device. I mean, do you know anything about it? Have you used it in other times and you know, how, how does it work? I don't know exactly how it worked. I, I didn't use it again, but there were several uh, systems that created artificial gravity and could turn it down. So on Ceres colony, the entire colony, which we're talking about miles and miles, like millions of square feet 
of GravMat. They called it uh, GravMat or gravity plating. And there were a couple of times when I would see it when it was about to be built, they had piles of it stacked up, ready to be installed in areas that they were going in. And they usually had two plates and then coils and cylinders in between the plates. That's what it looked like. And they were usually a meter by meter size and they plugged into each other, kind of like a Lego. They had a, like, a, like a protrusion and then a hole so that it would plug in and that was the electrical system. So that was, an uh, again, power output was what everybody dreamed of. You know, free energy was the was something that was real, but high powered free energy was not. So to have a really high power output, it was a marvel. There were times when I looked in caverns that were miles long and I just thought to myself, every inch of this is powered. The floor has got power going through it for the artificial gravity. And it was a marvel to me. They increased the gravity in that case. That's right, because the... The Dwarf Planet series is only like 580 miles big. There's microgravity. So in the mines, when they mined out places, and it's a chalky, rocky, the entire thing is made, it's like a really chalky consistency. And when they would mine it out, they would do it in microgravity. And then they had vacuums, like huge vacuum systems that would get the dust and everything. And they would immediately install grav, grav mat and then uh, go in and continue mining, set up and then clean up and continue mining. So it seems this anti-gravity technology is pervasive in this space installation. Do you have visibility on who does it? We were aware there's a lot of research and development on Mars. There are, con there are underground colonies on Mars where they're doing a lot of research and development. Ceres Colony had research and development places there, um, but they were more focused on things to trade. So they were working on pharmaceuticals and they were, they were coming up with marketing things to trade with other species. There isn't really a universal currency. It's technology that they can trade knowledge. So there were times that we traded goods and we traded things for just mathematical equations. Most places in the solar system that can fit a colony inside of it have some sort of underground uh, facility. So there were many places that we went around Jupiter. Most of the bodies around Jupiter have bases in some, in some form in them. And we would go there. So they were very spread out. But Ceres Colony, for the most part, was a civilian and military you know, base. So there was R&D there, but they had other places that they did that too. And I was also told that not so much on the Earth, that they didn't have, they didn't have any facilities really on the Earth as far as R&D goes. The high command was in Antarctica, and that was 100% like a military administration. And... Uh, R&D happened elsewhere. What do you mean the I command of what? They identified themselves as Deutsch, the Deutsch culture. In your opinion, or what you know, for the solar warden, where is the pulsing heart? I believe that the solar warden has most of their facilities in the Arctic, up in like the Arctic Circle in Canada. There are islands up there and they have underground bases up there. And that's where they're, most of the solar warden um, infrastructure is. We will discuss above top secret technological developments at the first Silicon Valley Conference on Secret Space Technology Business Applications. Experiencies and witnesses of advanced technologies will present how they have interacted with innovations and discoveries far beyond our current reality, but one day possibly becoming our reality. In this conference, we will discuss the futuristic civilian applications of these technologies to our economy. It is about time that we start challenging our current beliefs and limitations and start to envision a more advanced civilization for us and our children. One day, we may be using some of these secret space technologies to build viable civilian business applications. You mentioned that in this mission and in other mission, you make use of communication devices. Can you tell us something about it? Like what they are, how do they work? The reason I remember the implant is because it worked, it had a Bluetooth range. It worked with the same range of Bluetooth, the translators. So I would, towards the end of my career, I would go to mission briefings and they would speak, the, the um, command staff would speak pr primarily in German, which I did not know. And they would turn it on and off. So when they wanted to speak privately amongst themselves and not have guys like me listen, they would turn off the translator and they could speak about, they could talk about us or talk about things and, and we wouldn't understand them. And then they could turn it back on. They had, they had like, a, uh, like a tablet that they could turn it on and off. The other thing is that it worked automatically at the exits of the ship. So when you got near the exit, you could meet, it was always on and within Bluetooth range, like about the range of a Bluetooth. We would speak out loud 
and they could hear it. You could okay, hear it in your head. Okay, but do you also hear they speaking or you don't? Or the speaking is suppressed? You can hear it. You can hear them speaking too, but it's louder on the inside. If you had your eyes closed, you know, and you couldn't hear their voice, for instance, the implant would still give you an idea of what direction they were coming from, and you would hear difference in their voices as well. So you could you could tell who it was. Do you know anything where they put the implant? It had to be uh, in the back of the head. There was a lot going on in the back of my head. Like there were surgeries that I remember getting where they opened up the back of my head and did things. It was on the moon before I went to Mars that I got most of the surgeries um, before I was shipped out to Mars, to the Mars Colony Corp. And that's when a lot of the augmentations took place. There was a time when I got on the elevator, I was called to the to the bridge. And I was, I stood outside the elevator and two guys were talking in German. As soon as we walked in, I could understand them. And as soon as you crossed inside the door of the elevator, the translator worked. And then when they walked back out, I couldn't understand them again. So do they have restaurants in, in chairs? They had a red light district. Oh, really? Yeah. They had a shopping district. They had restaurants. They had streets. And this is all were... underground though. The, Giant the... caverns. Uh, the, some of the caverns, the, the top, the ceiling of the cavern, you couldn't even see it. Uh, some of them were th two, three hundred feet high, and some of them were smaller caverns that were, you know, seventy-five feet tall. And it was a—you could see that they had machined a cavern in there and built European-style um, buildings inside of it. They had um, fake skies, you know, like they would paint uh, blue skies and clouds on the top of the cavern and shine lights. And then it had a system, like a twenty-hour day. Uh, it was like twenty hours. That the system it would get darker dimmer not always dark but it would get dim and then some places it was always dark there were things that were rusty it was old by the time i got there a lot of the architecture was old and they were still building there was still they were building at a very fast rate there were businesses in just the two years that i had freedom enough to move around there were businesses that got remodeled twice in that time completely gutted and remodeled they had a very fast system of of uh construction so, but uh, how is the society working there? Like, do they have a currency? Do they do trade? Like, uh... most of the businesses were managed by an ET race. The uh, some of the businesses, they it was a military structure. So the the commander of the military was in effect like the president. That was what the it was ran by the military. There was currency. They had nylon feeling plastic like a cash that you didn't need it, you could pay and they had facial recognition technology that would deduct right out of your bank account. They had cryptocurrency. There are ET species that don't use money. And so, but the, what they found is that they're not wasteful. So they would get facial recognition account and it was basically unlimited. They didn't, they didn't have a spending limit. How do they organize? Do you know that? No. I'm not sure, but what I was told was that they were not wasteful. So that we were jealous of them because they had unlimited spending. They could literally go anywhere and buy anything they wanted. How many people live there in Ceres? Uh, just under a quarter million. About 225,000 was the was the number that I was told. And there's no way for me to know if that's accurate or not, but that's what I was told. About 225,000 and 30 or 40,000 of them were slave labor or free labor, like uh, like what I was. How did this 200, 250,000 people get there? Did they get there all at the beginning or, or they still have an ongoing amount of people that go there? Uh, what I was told was that originally that it was an abandoned base, that there was a very small populace that that another species built the caverns and the base early on, like a million years ago kind of thing. I don't know the exact time frame, but that the base was abandoned. And when the Deutsch made their treaty with the Orion group, they were given series and said, you could go there and build in. And they immediately went in there and began to convert it and make it for living quarters for humans. So they converted a lot of the caverns and, and the first thing they did was build European style cities. In fact, there's a there was a large cavern that was there, um, like the big draw. And that was, it had an entire replica of a European city in there. I believe it was Copenhagen or one of those cities. The last day in the job, how does it look like? What happens the last day? In the last six months I was there, I disobeyed a direct order and was demoted. And so most of the time, there was a bit of a ceremony where first thing in the morning uh, when everybody got on board the ship or right outside the ship the person that was going home we'd all meet them there and give them hugs and congratulations and goodbye for people we knew we were going back um, but me because i'd been demoted in kind of a dishonorable way I, when i got to the ship in the morning off the train everything was connected by train when i got off the train to go on the ship there was an officer waiting for me there and he said you come with me 
and we walked quite a long ways um, to a smaller hangar and it was a disc. You know, we had a talk about my whole time there, about, about my service record. He was aware of my record and everything. And, you know, he told me to go back to my life and marry a German girl and lead a quiet life and don't worry about any of this. I said, I'm going to remember this. And uh, he said, don't worry about remembering this. Go back to your live a quiet life and marry a, settle down, marry a nice German girl. It's funny because that's kind of what I did. But uh, I went on a disc. And really, the process of going back was weeks from that from that day, the, my last day there, it was a matter of weeks before I was done and actually woke up in my bed the next morning after I was taken back in 1982. The like I woke up the, from the disc, the disc is to uh, the moon, to a base of the trapezoid base on the back of the moon. It was where I went. And I know this because during the process of blank slating, they were aware that I wasn't that it wasn't successful and I was going to remember. And so they moved me to a different office for a separate treatment for an additional round of treatment to try to in the blank slating process or the, the conditioning process. And at that in that office, I could see the lunar surface. It was a corner. It was an office that had a window and I could see the lunar surface at night. It was nighttime. Do you have recollection of the last like when you go back to Earth? They had concluded they were going to uh, give me surgery. They were going to put me back crippled. And my service record had been deleted. So there was no, so there was a paperwork issue. And they said, just put him back. But there's no paperwork. It doesn't matter if he remembers or not because he's not in the system. And so they, uh, he said, this is your lucky day. There was a short reptilian, which was my chaperone. Like walking from one place to the other was kind of like I went into a hypnotic state where I don't remember, like, you, you know, I was being chaperoned. That was it. That was the last thing I remember. And I woke up in my bed the next morning. He said, this is your lucky day. And I kind of went blanked out again. And I woke up in my bed. And it was Friday morning in 1980, in April of 1982. And I felt like I hadn't been in my house for 20 years. I, I was lost. I, I didn't recognize my toys in my room. I went down and hugged my mom like I had never seen her. My mom and dad and my sister. I was so happy to be back. And I had no idea why. Like in, in the beginning, uh, for many years, I, I had bleed through memories, but not a really, um, not a large amount of memory that explained what had happened, but I had the feeling of being gone. Do you think logically they will be able to keep this secret forever? No, absolutely not. And that's what we're seeing. That's why the world is going through what it's been going through. We're, we're, we're in a pre-disclosure time. They either have to kill us all off or they have to disclose because we're getting to the point where somebody can roll out 10 years ago, 20 years ago, somebody couldn't build an off-axis paraboloid with a polarized spectrometer in their garage. And in 10 years from now, we will be able to. And with that technology, with just that kind of telescope, you'd be able to measure the amount of methane in an exoplanet's atmosphere, and you'll be able to discover life out there. So we're getting to the point where the public has access to higher technology that they never did before. So the, the ability to hide life in the cosmos is going to be impossible. And I think that they're, they're going to do things to taper the population off. And we're seeing a, a lot of real efforts to revamp our power structure, our power consumption away from fossil fuels. Like around the Pacific Basin, we're seeing a lot of the third world countries being brought up to speed. And being, there's a great deal of infrastructure going into building, uh, building up a lot of countries around the world that are not very advanced technology. So we're seeing steps taken towards joining some of these groups in, after, in a post-disclosure way. So I think disclosure is inevitable. Okay, on that words, I would thank you very much for being here. This was extremely interesting. And for everybody who's interested, uh, he has a very articulated, long book of uh, his experience. So Ceres, Colin, and Cavalier, I recommend to take a real close look at it. Um, you might not believe all of these things, but uh, maybe 10 years from now, uh, you will regret not having believed it. So Tony, thank you very much. Thank you.